We are now joined by our good friend at Seton Hall University, Dr. Matt Hale, Associate Professor, Department of Political Science and Public Affairs. Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you. Uh, a few weeks after the 20, historic 2020 election, let's look into 2021. Here's the question that's been on my mind. Are we as polarized and as divided as we appear to be, not just in terms of the citizens in the country and how they voted, but also just our culture? Absolutely. It seems to me that we're living in two different worlds. There is a, a whole side of the, the, the spectrum that genuinely believes this election was stolen, genuinely believes that um, that's the only way that Trump could lose. Um, and there's a second side that doesn't believe that at all. I think the facts are on the second side, but you know, I think that we are we are absolutely in as polarized as I think we've ever been. But you know what? You say the facts are on one side. Here's what's interesting: the great Walter Lippmann, journalist, um, philosopher, if you will, said we're, the demo democracy can only work as in as its citizens are informed. And my question is this: since when did we get? in public policy and politics to choose our facts versus our opinion? So I, I think that there's a connection between facts and trust. And democracy is built on trust. We can't have a democracy unless you trust the institutions of government, the institutions that are providing the information, whether that's news media or experts. You, we, we literally cannot function without some trust that there's a commonality of, of belief in facts. And that's the most dangerous thing that we're facing right now, is that you can't move forward with any public policy until you agree on some baseline level of facts. Um, and we are in a situation right now where that's not happening, where no matter what side is speaking, the other side assumes they're lying or prevaricating or doing something for their own good. But, but Matt, as a, as a great professor and teacher, because I've been in the classroom with you of political science and public affairs, just deal with COVID. How could it be that you have an opinion on COVID? It is a public health crisis moving into 2021. This will be seen then. How could there be an opinion on whether masks should be worn or not, or whether we should distance ourselves? Are they not facts? So th absolutely, they're facts. But I think what's happening is that there's a part of the population that has a higher value than the public health. They're saying my freedom, my ability to not listen to my government, my ability to rebel against my government outweighs the public health concerns. What about and if so you're dead and the I'm people around you are, hold on, Matt, what about if in the process of your individual freedom, you get sick, ho hopefully knock on wood, you don't die, but you get somebody else sick and he or she dies. How does, what does that have to do with individual freedoms? So it, it doesn't, but what there's there's that's we're back to the idea of trust and lack of belief in facts. These the, the folks that are saying my freedom is more important don't trust the facts that they're going to get sick, right? And so that's the the connection and the combination. They don't trust that they're going to get sick, so their freedom matters more. If they trusted that they were going to get sick, their freedom would matter less. And so that's the that's the tough part not that we're in right now. And what about if you believe these things and then you go to media sources that reinforce what you already believe? Now, no secret, in public broadcasting, we don't have a horse in the race. We don't have a candidate. We don't have a philosophy other than we bring people on with different points of view. We're as objective as possible. But if someone believes something and they go to Fox or, um, or Newsmax or whatever, or someone else believes something else and they're at MSNBC, CNN, and you stay in a world, not to mention the websites that support what you believe. Trust me, there's a question here. How do you ever challenge your preconceived ideas? So, you know, one of the interesting things is, is back when the internet was first started, there was this excitement that we were all of a sudden going to have this, this idea realm where everybody was going to see different opinions and everybody was going to see that here's, here's one opinion and they were going to be able to make their own judgment. that's great. And that would, in theory, be great. But what we've seen is that people are absolutely balkanized by it. It's so easy to find information to confirm your opinion that that's all you go to. You never, the, the majority of people don't go to sources that are contradictory to their opinion. And that's a real problem. But now take it from the citizens to the policymakers. In Washington, as we speak, split government, White House, Congress, gridlock. If those policymakers in Washington are going to those news sources that reinforce what they believe and supporting them, what is the incentive to compromise on behalf of the American people and get stuff done? 
there's not. And I, you know, I, I think to, to a large extent, the next four years are not going to be about big policy wins. They're going to be about solving COVID-19 and keeping things calm. Literally, I think that that's what the majority of, if there's a majority in America, I would argue what they want is to stop thinking about politics every single day, to stop having six events every single day about politics. They want to go back to playing football. They want to go back to having Thanksgiving dinner. And that's what I think people most care about right now is calm, cool, collected, and get rid of COVID. But Donald Trump got well over 70 million votes, 72, three, four. I'm not sure what the number is going to be in the end. What do we say to those people? Because that's a huge chunk of this country. It is, and 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 for I, I, to be honest, I think there's a couple things. There are Donald Trump was, is the second highest vote getter for presidential votes ever, right? And other than Joe Biden, other than Joe Biden is is, is number one, right? But when you dig down into that Trump um, numbers, right? I think that there 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 is 35 percent of the American population that is bulletproof for Donald Trump, but then there is but but it doesn't go any higher than that. There's a ceiling that he has. Then there's a bunch of people who distrust Joe Biden, and particularly, I think, distrust the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And, and those folks are saying, you know what? I would just like to be calm, so let's make sure nothing gets done. And that's why you see the gains in the Senate and, and perhaps a Biden win. I think there was a lot of split ticket voting. Vote for the Republican for Senate and vote for Biden for president. And well, what I, are the implications and, in terms of getting things done if, in fact, everyone retreats to their corner and says, status quo for four years? We can't afford that. I, I, I think actually that's that's where I think we're headed. I think that the focus is going to be. Remember, new presidents essentially have eighteen months to two years to start to, to focus on what they're going to do before the next before, before twenty twenty four starts. So so the first eighteen to twenty four months, Joe Biden's going to be fixing COVID. That's it. That's COVID is going to be his his response to COVID is going to be his legacy. Um, I mean, he may be do some other things. Maybe we get some infrastructure stuff because everybody likes building and everybody likes jobs. Maybe we get some some uh, uh, another round of, of COVID relief. Maybe we can work that out. Um, but in terms of big policy changes, big policy issues, I think we're just holding tight, like you said, going to our corners. Hey, Matt, hey, we'll come back and we'll talk in a few months um, and keep things in perspective because uh, it's critically important. Dr. Hale, thank you so much, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Northward Center, PSENG, Suez North America, ADP, Valley Bank, the Adler Aphasia Center, NJ Best, and by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by NJ On Air. And by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. The North Ward Center was founded on the vision that community is connected to neighborhood stabilization. And neighborhoods need a place for kids to play. That's why we're building a recreational complex in the heart of Newark. Unfortunately, Inner city youth development programs are dwindling. We want to expand on our promise and build a place where kids are welcomed and doors remain open. The North Ward Center, building a better community, 48 years and counting.